Alice Doan Holland, and I was named for my grandmothers and was born to Clarence and Helen Doan on November 10, 1923, and lived in there until I was 18, 20. You're going to have to cut this piece out. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry about it. We can, no, okay. we can cut everything out that we don't want to use. Okay. Okay. All right. And, <clears throat> and uh, lived in Belmont. My parents continued to live in Belmont until they finally went into Meadowlark um, assisted living in their 90s. Dan. I'm Daniel Edward Dome, young brother of Mary. I was born on June 29, 1926, in the north bedroom of the Little Stone House. I lived there till I was about 26 years old when I got married and moved out of town. And um, as long as we're talking about that little stone house, because so many people know that, let's maybe talk about you know what your dad, what did your dad do for a living, and how did he happen to build that house? <laughs> well, father was a jack of all trades. He could do anything he wanted to do. If he didn't know how to do it, he would go around town, find somebody who was doing it spend a couple hours watching them, and then he would go do it and do a very good job. I was with him once. A uh, party wanted a corbelled porch on the front of their house. A corbel is that uh, eyelaster called on the end of the uh, porch where the inside goes straight up and the outside goes up at an angle. You see that in the 1920 houses. But he had never done one. So he just got in his car and drove around town till he found some gentleman who was doing one. Spent a couple hours watching him, then went over and built it and did a good job. Oh, my goodness, that's great. And uh, that's the type of thing he did. As we saw in the picture, uh, Blyfield Country Club down the street one stone wall along their driveway. It's still there, he built it. On West River Road, there's a stone wall in front of the Annis home. He built that. He built a number of different houses, including the little stone house. That was something that the mom and dad saw in a little book on house plans. Let's get a picture. Um, I have a idea. They, they, okay. um, they, can talk okay and while they're talking we can put a picture of it like yeah i understand so okay you don't have to have so they opening. okay great yeah. that's a good way to do it so i'm gonna just and then i can get like um that's great because i don't have to have a stone wall here and i think we should get that yeah a lot of people know that and we too. can just edit it like that okay so we're not going to give the we're not going to have you hold the pictures but this is great this is the kind these are the kind of stories we love to hear this kind of stuff so back in uh, about 19 well, they got married in 21. Not 1920. No. 1920, they got married while he was born in 21. And in summertime, Clarence was clamming, digging clamshells out of the Grand River from about Comstock Park all the way up to Knapp, the bridge. And the books will show a picture of a clam boat. These were made by the owners in their backyard out of two by twelves and one by fours and stuff like that. When they get it all made, they take a, a rope of oakum, which was kind of, kind of like horse hair with a lot of stinky stuff on it and shove that in all the cracks and make it waterproof. Then they had a 12 foot pole, two inch pole. That's what was their motor. They would pull that boat two or three miles up the river, then float down and dig up clams. When they got all the way down, they would take the boat, 
half full of clams and pull it back up the river and come back down again. And by the time they got done that, you'd be walking on maybe a foot of clams. Then what did they do with the clams? The clams went to a button factory. I forgot to bring that. All men's shirt buttons and women's dress buttons were made from mother of pearl in the, from the clamshells. That was a very big industry back in the 1920s and actually a little before that. It faded out in the 1930s after an inventor invented Bakelite. Bakelite is the first plastic in the country. And they started making buttons out of plastic as the clamshell business died, which was okay because the clamshells in the river were not reproducing. Eventually, there's another little story on that. Joseph Brewer, who was a rich man, banker in Grand Rapids, and a big politician, built a mansion up on the hill where is now the gravel pit on Cannonsburg Road, right near the Plainfield Bridge. Joe bought land on both sides of the river. And he had the idea that his riparian rights met in the middle of the river, and that gave him sole ownership of everything in the river. He did not like the fact that Clarence Stone, his father and three brothers, and probably about 10 other neighbors we're digging those clams out of the river for buttons. So he took Clarence Stone to, as the leader of the gang to court, claiming to the court that he owned all those and these guys were trespassing. When it was all over, Joe Brewer and his three rich attorneys lost the case to a gentleman with an eighth grade education and a lot of common sense. And I know this because I read about it in the Grand Rapids Herald. At the time, there was about a four or five line article in the paper written by the judge. He said he had never seen a uh, a defendant without attorneys do such a good job of defending himself. And you, your dad defended himself? Yes. Oh my gosh, that's great. Well, let me, I'm going to just get Mary in here for a minute. So do you remember going clamming then? What, what, what do you remember about the clamming experience? Well, I had some experience with clamming because after the clams were brought in with the boat, they had to empty the boat, and they would boil these clams over a huge bonfire in a, in a similar receptacle that looked something like a one of their flat bottom boats. And after they cooked the clams, then they were forked up onto a table. And then we who didn't get to go up and down the river got to dig the meats out of the clams and throw the clams into a pile, which grew over the summer uh, into several ton and then was sold. And <clears throat> the meats were, uh, you, you look through the meats because clams make uh, pearls. And if it's a very deformed pearl, it's called a slug. And we didn't find many really beautiful pearls, but Mother's engagement ring was fashioned from a, with a pearl in it that Dad had found when he clamped. And then I also later me and my brothers would take lunch down to the uh, gentleman on the river, and which was fine, we got to do that. Mother made the lunch and we carried it down there. But one day, um, dad was clamming with his younger brothers. He had, his mother had died and his father remarried and he had younger stepbrothers, uh, uh, half brothers, and <clears throat> One of these teenage boys, or the teenage boys were skinny dipping, and here comes Mary with a lunch, and they were so 
angry with Mary for coming, and all I did was bring them their lunch, and they didn't like the fact that I had come while they were skinny dipping. But these clams also had different names, and it, there were uh, several different kinds of clams, and they had different names, and we got so we could name them all. I can't name them now. Did you eat? The, did anybody eat the meat? Pigs. Oh, pigs ate the meat. <laughs> pigs ate the meat. Okay. Yes, they went to pig farms. Oh my God, that's so pig, interesting. There was so what pig, else? Oh, go ahead. There was a pig farm up on Post Road where the buckets were taken early in the morning before they went on the river. Oh my gosh, that so is great. Re everything was recycled. Okay, yeah. How long, how many years did you do the climbing? Well, they climbed, as Dan said, uh, during the 20s and it, as the climbing they, Dad could tell and others could tell that that uh, they were coming to the end of clamming. It was much more difficult to find them. And so he uh, talked to other people and pursued the idea that maybe there were other rivers and in different parts of the country that might have clams. And so it, it uh, led to a couple of trips. One trip when we were there were just four of us at the time, so we were pretty young. Uh, got into a car with camping gear and, and friends, the Van Seuss, and started a trip around the lake, looking at four different streams to see if they had, uh, it would be usable for getting clams, and didn't find any. And so then the next trip was down to Texas. Dad had her, somebody had told him that there was a, a, some rivers down there and he would be able to, uh, to dig clams there. And so he piled his young family and with a wife who was a few months pregnant and a teenage girl to help with the children. And we all got into this large car. I, I've forgotten what kind it was. 1927 Buick. Buick, okay. And started out for Texas. And we would, had, took camping gear and we would stay. Sometimes there would be uh, little houses on the way, cabins that you could rent and and we stayed at different places along the way and it took quite a while to get there. And I always wondered, how did we do that without any luggage? Where did our luggage go? Well, I think it was my Uncle Homer said, well, Dad had a trailer on the back and then on top of the trailer was this clam boat. And that's where the, all the gear went, was on that. And then he, at that time, cars had running boards, and he would strap things on the running board. And one of the, uh, and he took along tools so that he could do carpentry work in case, because he was going to have to look for work along the way. And after he got to Texas, until he could find clams, and uh, we went across the bridge, across the Mississippi, on a bridge that was a one-way bridge, but signals got mixed up between the people on either end who were sending cars across and, and our car and another car had to pass each other in the middle of this one lane bridge and, and all the tools were scraped against the side of the bridge and into the water. And so there went Dad's tools. Oh no! So that, I, I think that's most of my climbing stories, Dan. <laughs> Are you clammed out? <laughs> we can, yeah, because we don't have a whole lot of time. These, these are great stories. Right? I love hearing this stuff. Well, the, these stories are in the notebooks. Okay, okay. What, uh, um, so did you, did anything significant or traumatic happen to your family? Did anybody die by your, so many people have stories where some terrible tragedy befell them and they had to get through it. Was there anything like that uh, in your family? I wouldn't say a terrible tragedy. We did have our share of illnesses. We have one sister who was born in Weimar, Texas, um, that 
seemed to do things double. She had double mastoid when she was young, and that is a, a, a disease of the ear canal. Infection in your mastoid. Yeah, mastoid. And, and then she had double pneumonia, and then she had, uh, and then she, when the boys, Bob and Dan, were to graduate from the eighth grade, she and her sister, one had mumps and one had, no, they had something else that was Scarlet fever. Scarlet fever. Scarlet fever, and we were quarantined. And um, Brother Bob was quite unhappy that he was not able to make his eighth grade graduation because his sister had to get sick. And so outside of that, we, and okay, and Bob broke his leg one time, but, but we didn't really not have major. any, the main problem, of course, was this was during the Depression. It was very difficult for very many people to get work. And uh, so Dad would uh, take whatever came along, and usually he did a good job of it. Had a and, lot of mouths to feed, though. Yeah. A lot of kids. and So he just did whatever, he, he would just do different things. Okay. And whatever it took to make a living, put food on the table, he tackled it. And at that time, during the Depression, too, people made their own fun because they couldn't afford much else. And so my husband was telling me that uh, his father, oh, they lived in an army surplus tent while we were building this stone house on West River Drive. And they lived on the on the Grand River. And mother told me one time that her refrigerator was. Uh, Dad dug a hole in the side in the bank and lined it, and so that kept their butter and milk cold. And and we have a picture of of um, Wally as a very young boy, toddler, on the bank of the Grand River. And they, actually, that is how they did their uh, courting. Dad took mother canoeing on the Grand River at, in North Park. There was a boat and canoe club, and they would get canoes from there. This was, this was quite a thing on the Grand River for couples to go canoeing up and down the river. And then they'd take a picnic lunch and enjoy that. What did you guys do for fun when you were young? What did you do to entertain yourselves, all your kids, and like during the Depression and stuff? What did you do? Did you do a lot of things in the river? I mean, were you, were you right? You grew up right on the Grand River then, in that stone house. Well, we grew up in the stone house. Yeah. Wally was probably about two years old, and Mary was about one year old when they actually moved into it. But for two years, after the clamming was done in September, before cold weather came, they would move the tent up onto the seven acre parcel they had bought from Ida Conkle, whose home is on the corner of Belmont and West River Road. And uh, they would work on the house until such time as cold weather came, then they'd move downtown with Grandpa and Grandma Gould, mother's parents. One day, while they were working on the house, and the picture that you see there with a house with no roof on it. Where's Wally? I don't know. Where is he? He's not here. He's not there. Oh, my goodness. There's Wally walk crawling along the top of that stone wall, which is probably about eight inches wide. He was just a baby. Just, just a he, toddler. Yeah, yeah he's... Daddy quietly that. goes up his... Homemade ladder, crawls down the wall, picks up the baby, backs down the ladder, gave the baby to mama, grabbed his hammer, and took the t two bottom rungs off his ladder. <laughs> oh, that's great. So then, um, so you left, did you leave the house then to go into the army, or what did you do after you left the house when you were in your 20s? Well, uh, I was drafted one month after VJ Day, so I served in the Army of Occupation in Japan. And I left there when I was uh, 
about 20 years old. Came back home two years later and then went back to junior college and then Michigan State, so I was gone another couple of years. Then uh, a year after I graduated from Michigan State College, uh, I got married, moved to downtown. Downtown Grand Rapids? Downtown Grand Rapids. What did you do for your career? What did you, what did you do? I had a bachelor's degree in business with a major in real estate. That was following my father, who in 1937, when the clamming was done and no more clams, he got a real estate license of the Lauren Benjamin Teal office, and then eventually he got a uh, automobile license, an insurance license, and then a life insurance license. So he was selling. And uh, in 19. 41. He had a closing on a house he'd sold, and at that time the salespeople were not allowed in the closing. It was done by the broker. And his broker came out after the closing and said the closing did not take place. The buyer was $50 short. Well, why didn't you take $50 out of my commission and close the deal for me? They parted ways, and my dad got his own broker's license and operated the Seadone broker out of his living room until he passed away. Oh my gosh! Wow. At 97. He worked in that until he was 97? At 94, at the class, required class for uh, uh, real estate people. There was Clarence Doan, 94, Robert Doan, and Daniel Doan, all in that same class. We were all in the real estate business. Oh, wow. And to follow it up, well, uh, about three others in the family had real estate licenses at one time or another. And my son, Thomas, has one now in Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, hey, guys, it runs on the family. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mary? What did you do after you left the house then? Well, uh, after high school, I, in, during high school, Dad had told me that I should take a business course, and so I did that because he figured his children should be able to support themselves. And so after high school, I got a job actually working <coughs> um, with Western Union. and. And World War II started. I graduated in 1941. And then that summer, I was still 17. And, and it was difficult to get a job unless you were 18. And so I got a job at a summer camp on Crystal Lake. And then that fall, I uh, started working for Western Union. And uh, by the time I was 20, getting a little bit restless and Western Union was sending people at different parts of the of the country and I and a couple of the other young women from Western Union decided we would like to go and work in Chicago and so we did that for that winter and then I decided I would really like to see more of the country. Grand Rapids was pretty dead at this time with all the young men in the service and so I joined the Waves and went to uh, New York for boot camp at, in the Bronx. A women's college had been taken over for the boot camp. And then I went to male school there. And then um, I was sent to the fleet post office in San Francisco and sorted mail there that went all over the Pacific to the armed forces. And so I had had actually, I think, people have come and said, well, thank you for your service, and I say, oh. Actually, it was not a sacrifice. I had quite a lot of fun, and I felt kind of guilty about the whole thing, since uh, some of these uh, young men I have met had, had ships shot out from under them. But um, it, it, and then I stayed there until uh, VJ Day, which 
the city streets of San Francisco were just blue with uniforms. Uh, during that, all the streets, of course, were covered with sailors, very happy that the war had finally ended. And then I took a train back home. Uh, <laughs> and on my way, I called home and discovered that my brother Wally, now Wallace was born 23 months before I was born. So he was almost two when I was born. And while he was in the Navy Air Corps, he met a young woman in Kansas. And when I called dad, he said, Wally's getting married and we, none of us can make the wedding. And uh, how about you on your way home uh, going by way of Kansas? And so I took a bus up to Kansas and I was the best man and the maid of honor and the coordinator of this wedding. And <clears throat> we found a minister and, and um, found a bakery that had a cake. So we had a cake for the wedding and there was a jukebox on the wall. So we had music for this wedding. And then I left them there and, and got on the train again and went to Chicago only to discover that the railroad strike was on. And then, so this was the last train coming into Chicago, but it suddenly was settled and so uh, I was able to get on the first train to Grand Rapids going, going to Grand Rapids out of Chicago. And there weren't many people on this train, so I was talking with the conductor, and he said, well, would you like a job when you get home? And I, of course I would. I had no idea what I was going to do. And also no clothes, civilian clothes, because I gave those all to my sister when I went into the Navy. And so I came home and had a job uh, on the train as working in the, um, serving meals. They had dining cars at that time. You, you had full service and tablecloths, and it was really quite elegant. And so I went back and forth to Detroit and Chicago, staying overnight in Chicago and coming back the next day. And that lasted all summer. And uh, I foolishly had made a promise to meet with a friend in Ohio, and I couldn't get any time off, so I quit that, that, that train job. And so then I was without work because she said, she let me know, well, she couldn't meet me because she had a job and couldn't get time off. And so I was, we helped at that time. Our family owned a little general store in the corner of Pine Island and West River Drive, the trading post. And so I assisted with that uh, and met my future husband, Art Holland, uh, through that. And he had, a, he had a dark room, a small dark room in his house. He lived not very far from there in Comstock Park near Booth Drive on West River, and he had built a little uh, dark room there, and so he did my picture for me that I asked him to, I asked him if he would do a particular picture that it was a, it was a square picture and I'd take it to the drugstore and they'd always cut off somebody that had made an oblong picture, but he did a good job for me and he brought it to me and, and asked me out and we were married three months later. Three months? That's too fast, you should wait a while. <laughs> but for me, it worked beautifully. How many years were you married? We were married 58 years, and, um, and he died in 2005 in a congestive heart failure. But we, especially after we both were retired, we really had some good times because we traveled around the country and doing Michigan, doing National Senior Olympics, and then we got into Masters Track and Field and did that, so we traveled to many different cities 
around the country and saw lots of states. It was, that was, I, I say that uh, the peak of my life, I think, was at 75 when I traveled to England to participate in Masters Track and Field World Games in Gateshead, England, and actually brought home two, two silver, two golds, and two bronze medals oh from gosh. that. What did you what did you do? Track and field? Did track and field. I did I discovered I could run. I never knew that. At, at the age of sixty-four, because my husband was involved in the senior Olympics and he went to the first national meet in nineteen eighty seven. And on the way home he said, I think you could do this and I said, You do? And I'd been thinking about it and didn't tell him. And and he said, I do and and so we started very simply with a 100 meter dash in Michigan State Olympics and I didn't even know enough not to not to run the curve that you're supposed to stay in this straight lane oh okay and discovered that I could run and and uh, it, it just grew from there Amazing. and even to, to long jumping really yeah, so I ended up with a national indoor record and even a a world indoor record briefly. At for, what age was this? Um, in my seventies, and I was seventy five when I went to England. Oh my God, that's great! Well, let's hear. And what stories have you got about your? Uh, <laughs> and, and tell me about. I didn't know. I didn't know your parents. Was it your parents had the training post? Clarence's Trading Post. Clarence's Trading Post, okay. Now, how did he get that? Yeah. Clarence was a real estate broker. This little grocery store and gas station on the corner of Pile Hollow Lake Road and West River Road was for sale, and he listed it and sold it. Well, after a while, the owner decided he wanted out, so Clarence listed it and sold it. And that guy decided the same thing, so after a couple of years, he listed it and it couldn't sell. And the current owner was a printer from Wayland and he wanted to go back to work as a printer in Wayland. And he was just gonna close the door and leave. Partially because he had two teenage daughters and they were living in the basement of the grocery store. So, okay, why not? Family can run the place. So he bought it and opened the grocery store. So we learned to cut meat and put it in the case for sale. We learned to grind meat. And during the rationing, it was a, he owned this thing during rationing. You could buy a steak for maybe uh, 10 coupons per pound, but hamburger was only five. So nobody wanted the steaks. And the steaks would sit there for a couple of days and turn from red to dark. So we learned to grind up steaks. We also learned to eat steak breakfast, lunch, and dinner until we couldn't stand them. <laughs> Everybody else wanted one. But that store at the time was supporting practically all the family. Dad and mother, brother and his wife, sister and her husband, two sisters and their husbands. There was a piece of ground next to it for sale. Okay, Dad bought that piece of ground, designed and built Brookhaven Trailer Park. About 21 uh, pads, it's just a small park. And from there, he put a mobile home sales lot out in front. And one of the things about mobile homes back at that time, they were eight foot wide, and they could be up to maybe 60 feet long. But they were narrow and not enough room. So he kept thinking about, what am I gonna do about that to help people live in these things? He said, three o'clock one morning, I woke up. That's what we do. He reached over on his lap table, grabbed the pad of paper, made a sketch and some notes, 
got up at 6 o'clock in the morning, went down to the sales lot, hooked a trailer behind his car, drove it home about four miles, parked it right behind the back of the house, and immediately started making an expando. He got the patent for the expandos. He made a couple of them in the backyard. Then he built a factory north of Rockford. It's still there, the Smith Block building, just, uh, just south of 13 Mile Road. And he started manufacturing them. I think he made around maybe six of them. Then what happened? Well, the state says, you can now drive a 10 wide on the highway. Now you can drive a 12 wide on the highway. Now you can drive a 14 wide on the highway. In other words, double wide mobile homes were now available and there was no need for the expando. Oh, okay. So that went broke. Okay. I, I happen to have the patent under it, my bed. <laughs> uh, Your dad sounds like quite a character. Oh, he was. <laughs> What tell me about, them? speaking of the mobile home, tell me about your um, brother then that started Leisure Village. Because Leisure, a lot of people know about Leisure Village. Give me the history on that. Okay, actually, yes. Um, they were looking for more land. They had decided, mother and dad had started going to Florida uh, when they were in their 60s. And they liked that. And they had retirement homes in Florida. And so they thought, such a park would be great in Michigan. And so they were looking for some land and mother tells me it was she who found this farm that was for sale out here on Cannonsburg Road uh, and Chauncey Drive. And so they looked it over and, and decided to buy that. And then um, Wally and his wife Joyce uh, <coughs> did the main part of the work and uh, and made this Leisure Village. And then they added on later, later Leisure Lee behind Leisure Village when it was, uh, when it was completed and, and pretty full. And it has been a successful operation since then. I think it's sold at least twice since then. But um, most this was of- about what year was this that he did this about? Uh, 19, early 1960s, okay. 1950s, I think the late 1950s and into 1960, uh, because they eventually, Wally and Joyce did divorce and then they sold the place at that time. And, but uh, they also went to Florida and did quite a lot of traveling and but there was another story about Brookhaven Trailer Park during the tornado. I don't think we got into that one. Uh, this was April 3rd, 1956. A tornado came through from Stan and was on the ground most of the way from Standale up through Rockford, I believe. And it, uh, it went over our house or right next to our house and toppled our chimney into the into the roof and blew out the picture window and back and and uh, and messed up the house somewhat, but didn't damage it so badly that we just repaired it and uh, and continued to live there. But did blow away the garage and Art's beloved plywood canoe was smashed. He just loved canoeing, and so we got a McGrumman aluminum one shortly after that and. But the tornado went on through Comstock Park and took out quite a bit and took out uh, the Brookhaven Mobile Home Park, just decimated it. Fortunately, I don't think anybody was hurt uh, seriously. It was something one, one broken arm. Yeah. And, uh, but it also took out, while he had a, right next to the little store, he had uh, a gas station, Old Dutch gas station and it demolished the gas station, but the pumps were still operable. So they operated this gas station out of their car while they re rebuilt the, the um, gas station and continued there. And then eventually they sold it to Brenner, who is uh, Brenner's uh, 
I think he repairs cars there and he has a little bait shop there now. Oh yeah, okay. But it, uh, the tornado then, we thought maybe it was going to go out and take out the little stone house, but it turned and went up to Rockford instead. Um, One thing she didn't mention. Okay. Our had paddle a canoe on every river in the state. Oh yes. And uh, there's a plaque in the Detroit Museum or something. It's at the Detroit Fairgrounds, I believe. Fairgrounds. Yeah. State amateur canoeist. Yeah. That, this yeah. is your husband. That's my husband. And <laughs> these canoeists. What was the story of your first baby? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Our, our son, Doug, was 18 months old and we went canoeing on the uh, Grand River. And uh, Art, uh, he had a life jacket on, of course, and Art had a rope tied to the, to the jacket and to the canoe. And Doug did fall in, but I just reached in, pulled him out, and put him back in the canoe, and we continued on. And then we, uh, later that summer, we went down the Osabo River, uh, camping out on our way down. And I dried diapers on the bushes while he, <laughs> on, that, on that particular trip. We did, did a lot of canoeing, and he raised a lot of canoes, and they started he and his brother Ray started the uh, Rockford Canoe Race. And, and they started at uh, 12 Mile Road and went all the way to Grand River. And they shortened that one to end at the dam eventually. But I think they still have that canoe race taken over by one of the organizations, maybe the JCs or here in Rockford. Wow. That's but that was just one of his, he was, he was the consummate athlete. He just loved it. I can remember watching his family who lived um, at 5632 West River Drive, which is near the railroad tracks where they crossed the river and now the trail, uh, North Country Trail, White Pine oh, Trail, oh, White Pine Trail uh -huh. goes across there now and and it, I would drive past there and all these kids would be out playing ball and so he was playing sandlot ball between his house and his grandparents house and he played baseball from sandlot to semi-pro until they didn't play baseball anymore and he played um, hard, um, he played softball. He played the uh, fast pitch softball at, Nan, at Ann and Turner until they closed that field to put an expressway through. And then he started playing in the city league at softball, and, uh, and gradually that league became co-ed. And so I also started playing, and I didn't know how to play softball, but uh, I couldn't hit the ball out of the, out of the infield but the, these fellows on the other team didn't realize that I could run. And at first, I was able to get to first base before they could throw me out, even though the ball was only in the infield. And, but that didn't last too long. That is great. And tell me about, because I, I want to show that picture of the, how, is, it, is there a chair named after him? It, it looked like oh, a, a, I, I um, when he so was. So what about his photography business? Yes. He was, in, the, in World War II, he was a Marine and, and air, um, phot air photographer. And so he studied photography. He was always interested in photography, and he studied that. So when he came back home, he got a job with James Bain Company uh, uh, on the GI Bill and as an apprentice and uh, started going to furniture markets and and shooting furniture here in, and uh, factories here in Grand Rapids. And so he did travel quite a bit the first good many of our years. And eventually, over a period of time, uh, Forslund was one of his customers. And Mr. Carl Forslund and Art got along very well. And he 
named one of his newer, uh, when he started making a particular chair, he named it the Art Holland chair. And one Christmas, our son gave us one for Christmas, gave his dad one for Christmas. So we have an Art Holland chair. That is great. That is great. And then eventually James Bain uh, went into bankruptcy because most of the uh, furniture photography uh, went to other places and he um, <clears throat> tried to, uh, getting jobs with other companies and it didn't always work out and so he started his own company, Art Holland Photography, and in January 1st, 1975 and retired December 31st, 1987 and actually did very well because he had a following. All of these people that he took pictures for continued to use him as their photographer and uh, so it became a successful business. Did you help him with the business or what were you doing? Or Everybody <laughs> helped with the business. <laughs> um, this was back before digital and so he would drive, he would need somebody to go with him to help move furniture and that sort of thing and then he would always hit, need some help in the printing lab and drying prints and so yes I helped him, his children helped him, and his nieces and nephews and brothers, and all, he gathered everybody over a period of time to help with the printing. Oh, gosh. Did you help too, Dan, or no? Oh, sure. Did you? Got to go to Chicago. Oh, you had to go to Chicago for a shoot or something? Yeah. Uh, Art's job was to take pictures of the furniture that was in the market, uh, furniture market and other places. Uh, his job started at five o'clock when the place closed and ended at about six o'clock in the morning when the place was ready to open. So he worked all night after driving down there. When he was working in South Carolina, he tried once to drive home after working all day or all night. I think he ran off the road somewhere in the mountains. It, I think it was slippery. It was uh, it was rainy, and when he was going down one of their mountains, uh, and I, the car. I hate that drive. <laughs> My son lives in Raleigh. You got to go through the mountains to get home. Yeah, I'm getting around that, I guess. Maybe we should mention. I don't think either of us mentioned that. Uh, I have three children: Douglas who is an attorney in southern Indiana, and then Pam, who married Brian Smith, and they have three children, and Vicki Tingley, who married Brian Tingley, and they did not have children, but she works, uh, but Brian's father owns business, and they work in that business. And so I have three children, three grandchildren, and now two great-grandchildren, great-granddaughters. Katie, the second grandchild, uh, has two little girls. Great. How about you, Dan? Do you have kids? What are your... Yeah, what we, you had, we had four children, two girls and two boys. Uh, it so happens that they were scattered around the country until uh, last week when my son, who uh, had been in Oregon for 20-some years, had come back to Michigan about four years ago, bought a great big house, and he sold that a month ago and moved last week. So that now all three of my uh, local children are within a half a mile of each other, walking distance, actually, South of Caledonia. The other one is in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's the one that now is a real estate broker. The oldest ch child is uh, Janice. She's got 30-some uh, years at an uh, insurance company, and her husband, is, she met there, is uh, about 30 years there. Uh, daughter Becky is retired. She was at the Forest Hills Schools. 
and uh, James is now director of uh, call-in station at uh, Priority Health, and uh, they're all doing quite well. Uh, the one grandson, Janice's grand uh, son, just came back from California last January, and. Uh, Ten weeks ago, he had a daughter, and uh, yeah. What else? So they're all doing all doing okay. And but four years ago, about, about you guys growing up here, what some of the things you? What are some of your most vivid memories? I'm sure climbing is probably one of them, but mm -hmm. what are some of your other memories of growing up in the city? <laughs> and what, what did you like? What, what, I can remember one particular one when I was quite young. Um, West River Drive, in that particular area at least, is all sand underneath. And we have, um, and they had left a spot in the front yard that they didn't, didn't uh, sow with grass, and that was our sandbox. It was quite a large sandbox, and did, we did a lot of playing there. And then along the road, uh, West River Road was a gravel road and I remember along the road they paved that road one year uh, in cement and one day we my friend and I were playing along the road in the sand and along came a fellow with a bag of grass seed over his shoulder and he was sowing grass seed along the edge of the highway and we told him not to, to put any grass there. We wanted to play there. And, and he did anyway and said, we bury it, and we buried it. And he laughed. But that was one of my vivid memories of, of that. And then playing in the sand, um, there was a family with six girls who lived next door, except next door was not right next door. It was a couple blocks away. And, and they had also had a sandbox uh, in back there and, and even under their, even their floor of their garage, I think was sand. And, and that was nice and cool to play in in the, in the summer. How about you, Dan? What, what do you remember about being a kid living on the river? And My that? daddy's favorite magazine was the Saturday Evening Post. One day when I was eight years old, like to read the post, there was a coupon. Start your own business with a magazine route. So I cut the coupon out, sent it into the Saturday Evening Post, and after a few weeks, I got notice that across the street from the school, in the uh, Daniel Court General Store, was my first uh, stack of magazines with a bag to carry them in. So I went over, picked them up, put the bag around my shoulder, and started home about a mile away, knocking on every door as I went, see if they wanted to buy a Saturday evening post. When I got home, I told Mom and Dad I'm in business. Well, they thought that was quite something. I was eight years old. So they uh, thought that was a good idea. I went on down another two or three miles along the road and sold all my magazines. So every week I was selling Saturday Evening Post. And then started selling the Ladies Home Journal off the other shoulder. And a couple years later, Brother Wally got a job with the local dairy man next door. So his Grand Rapids Press route went down to Mary Alice. Mary Alice's went down to Bob. Bob went down to Dan. And I started walking in Grand Rapids Press Road and dropped the Saturday Evening Post. And that press road, I figured out one day, was six miles long. I was walking it every day. And the press, in their great wisdom, said you could not collect for the paper while you're delivering it. So you had to go back on the road another day to collect. Well, sometimes the people simply would not come to the door. 
It was during the Depression, and they didn't have the three cents that the Grand Rapids Press cost at that time. This went on until Dad bought the grocery store. And I was 16 years old. And we, at that time, had a monopoly. Bob had a route, I had a route, Beverly had a route, and I think maybe Phyllis was coming up for a route. And when he bought the grocery store, we sold all the routes to some of the other kids. But for about 10 years, the Dolans had a monopoly on the Grand Rapids Press. Oh, Wally, when he started, was also delivering the Herald in the morning. So he was delivering newspapers seven days a week before school. He slept through the first classes at school. And his teachers knew back then that, that was part of life. It was okay. Yeah. Where did you guys go to school? Belmont Elementary. Oh, so no, so you went to Belmont Elementary College? Yes. Everybody yeah. went there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, did you? <laughs> oh, I went to Belmont Road. On Belmont Road, yes. yes. And at that time, uh, at the time I went to school there, the, the um, school building there that was considered the new school had uh, three, had two rooms, kindergarten, first and second, and in one room with one teacher, uh, Mrs. Uh, Patton. And in the next, the other room had Mrs. Jackman with the third, fourth, and fifth grades. So you really got exposed to all three grades at one time. And then, and then uh, the old school, which was on the corner of Grove River Road and, and uh, uh, Belmont Road, which is now the, I think it's a Buddhist temple. And so they had to open that up again. And the sixth, seventh, and eighth was there. Well, that school did not have indoor plumbing. And uh, which was very inconvenient, especially for teenage girls, and 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 I I believe it had a just a central stove too, as I recall. But anyway, during that time, uh, I did the seventh and eighth grade together, and so I graduated one year earlier, but it was where I should have been because when we went to Texas, uh, I had my fifth birthday in Texas and they did not start school until the sixth, until you were six. Wally had already completed kindergarten, but he had to take it over again and I didn't get to go to school. So I started school one year late and, and he lost a year doing that too. So we graduated together out of the eighth grade. And then I went to Comstock Park High School to that big town of Comstock Park. And he went to Davis Tech. And what was Davis Tech? Davis Tech was, it eventually became part of junior college after the war. During, the, during World War II, it, I believe that it housed some of the uh, weather school that came to town. And but it, uh, it, <clears throat> it became part of junior college, and it was more of a vocational school. It had regular curriculum, curriculum but it also had other things, and, and the boys went there particularly to learn about motors, especially cars. Wally was very good at cars. Mm -hmm. Did you go there to the end? All three of us boys went to the Davis Tech. George A. Davis Technical and Vocational High School. Where and was it? Actually, it is where Grand Rapids Community College is now. Oh. In 1944, that was the last graduating class. I was in that class. Then they closed Davis Tech as a high school, eliminated it, and moved Junior College two blocks down the street into that building. On the fifth floor of that building was the Board of Education. And they finally moved out and gave junior college more room. They moved, they bought Calvin, uh, College's whole campus in the southeast end. Oh. And moved over there. Uh, since then, uh, Grand Rapids Junior College, Grand Rapids Community there, 
College is now about a hundred. It was a hundred years old last year. Uh, while I was at the high school, it started around 1927. Mr. George B. Frazee was the new principal that started the school. He was also the retiring principal when they closed it. And we got to know each other quite well. Because if you were late to school, which we were frequently, living 10 miles out in the country, you got to spend a half an hour after classes in the afternoon in his office. And he had a his office was probably almost a third of the size of this room. It's big. There's plenty of room for three or four students to study while he was working on his big desk. All the furniture in his office was made at the school. Furniture making and, and furniture pattern making in an automobile and machine shop were taught half days. And then regular high school classes were taught in half days. So after I graduated, I went over to a, a Union High School to get some science courses that I was unable to take at uh, Davis Tech. In the drafting class at Union High School, I designed a ranch house with a curved corner in the living room. When I came home on furlough, 1946. That house was half built next door to Dad's home. Dad and Wally found that plan and were building that house. Did it ever get done? Oh, yes. They made the comment that corner in the living room was curved about a six foot radius or something like that. From the foundation to the roof, he says, we'll never do that again. <laughs> Yeah, that was, oh, and another thing that they were doing that I had not designed was they were making heat in the floor. The house has a concrete floor above the basement on concrete beams. And uh, couldn't buy copper pipe at that time, so it was black iron gas pipe in the floor. You couldn't buy a boiler at that time, so they bought a hot water heater and hooked that up. And after the first year, they decided that the house was so cold the first year, in the winter time. They pulled the carpet up, removed the pad, put the carpet back down. That's what took care of it. Today they have a pad that is designed for the heat to come through. Well, I can tell you about stories. These are exactly the kind of stories I love to hear. I can tell you about our house. Okay. Um, I'm still living in it. Um, Dad and Wally after, had built his Wally's house, and now they they really needed another job. And Art and I got married, and lo and behold, Dad and Wally wanted me to wanted us to build a house now. And after World War II. Everybody was building, and all the all the service people were coming home and needing places to live, and so it was difficult sometimes to get uh, the the material that you needed to build. But Dad had found a place in Comstock Park, which he thought was just perfect for us, and and uh, so we built there. They built for us there, Dad and Wally. At the same time, they built a house next door. And they were going to sell that house, uh, <clears throat> hopefully, and try to get into the building business. And one of the things that they couldn't do was they could not put in electricity right away or a telephone because they couldn't get poles. And so we moved in before we could get uh, we moved in December 2nd, early December, the first week of December in 1947. 
and we did not have electricity, so I used the attic steps for a refrigerator. There was a creek running down in back. We used that for uh, flushing, and and where the uh, across the West River Drive, where the expressway goes across, uh, there used to be a Lamro Spring, and we would get our drinking water from the spring. And uh, eventually, they did get uh, posts, and so we got electricity. How, well, did you, how long did you like that without electricity? Uh, just mainly that winter. And uh, we did have an electric line running from a house that was a good city block away for emergency. And uh, a couple of times I thought it was an emergency, but I needed it. And then the, then the lights would dim, and oh, it actually it lit the house. That's what I was supposed to use it for, is only to light, you know, the lights. And the one time I was ironing, and that pulled in too much electricity, and the electricity at our house, everything started to dim, and also at the house where it came from, and they objected to that. So consumers got us a pole fairly quickly after that. And then I was pregnant for our first child. Two years later, we still didn't have a phone because we couldn't get a pole. And uh, and my neighbor said, "Well, Mary, um, if you if you uh, need us, just hang a pole in your back door, and we'll see it. We'll come over." I didn't think that was very efficient, but fortunately, I didn't need them. And and uh, it worked out. We eventually got our phone. Anything else that you Well, that brings up the story of the little stone house. Oh, yeah. There was no electricity that far out from town. That little stone house had no plumbing, no electricity, no telephone. It was just a little house we went to. 600 square feet. she got a washing machine with a hand crank on there. Don't put your hand in it because it hurts, which I did once. <laughs> and after she got through the washing, somebody had to carry that water to the basement up the steps and up to the backyard and throw it down there. So we learned to pump the water in the backyard, carry it down for the laundry, and carry it back out again. The outhouse was about 80 
Dad was working on that house from the time 1921 until about 1985 before he quit. Oh my God! <laughs> he kept adding. He never stopped working. On it. Well, kept adding as he as he got enough money to do it. He would add a room. You know? and I remember um, he uh, he would they wanted to add a kitchen on the back and. And they did eventually a quite a large kitchen dining area. But uh, Pete Court dug the this as I said, there this land was sand. Pete Court dug a basement with his horses and I don't know, kind some kind of a scoop. Big scoop, not that big. Yeah, and and um, Dad wasn't able to start building immediately, so he put uh, long planks from the back door up over this chasm, and then on the sides it had uh, railings so that you know children wouldn't fall off. Well, children would walk the tops of these rails and jump off into the sand. So, when you think of some of the things that we did, you could get uh, sighted, and your children could be taken away from you for child endangerment. But um, I remember actually something I did that I would think, oh, that would never work today. Um, I, had, I had learned to be, I went to po uh, postal school while I was in the Navy. And so I learned some of that. And after I got back home and needed a job, um, I, the local postmaster in Comstock Park offered me a job in the post office there. At that time, it was before civil service, so he could decide who was going to work. And we had a small post office in the back of Lammer General Store, which now, okay, it's been a bank. It's on, on the corner where Mill Creek comes in. And there was just uh, just a small post office there. Well, it grew, and they built a post office across the street, um, and then eventually they built the one where where they have the post office now. But I, over the years, I had a job at various times, uh, working in the post office part time as a part time flexible. And when Doug was two years old. Um, I could work part-time there, but I had to get to Comstock Park, and I had to get a sitter for Doug. Well, where I lived, there, were, there was nobody around, and I didn't have a car. So I put him in a little red wagon, uh, took him down to uh, West River Drive. I live on Four Mile. Down to West River Drive, which is eight-tenths of a mile, and a bus would go through called the North Star Lines, and I knew what time it was going through, so we met the bus, and I put Doug on the bus. He was two and a half. Put the Doug onto the bus, and I had arranged for the driver to drop him off either at my sister's at Brookhaven Trailer Park, or at my sister-in-law's, or at my mother's. And this is a two and a half year old child. And he just loved it. He got to go out there and play with his cousins. And uh, I got to I got to go to work. We didn't, you know, oh, we too true. didn't didn't have very much money at the time. Well, this is that's, good. I think I think we've got plenty of humor. Uh -huh. I think we've got plenty. This is for really fun. <laughs> I told you it would be fun, didn't it? Okay. <laughs> it's fun for me. I don't know it's been fun for you, but some of that's in here and a lot more. Okay. <laughs> Thing. Oh, okay. okay, Art and his brother Dick and his um, Art and brother Dick, son Doug, and son in law Brian Smith are all in the Comstock Park uh, Athletic Hall of Fame on their first class, uh, and his daughter Vicki. And then Vicki thought that that mom should be in the Hall of Fame, so unbeknownst to me, she had um, 
submitted art in my name as a, as a unit for the first Michigan Senior Olympic Hall of Fame, and uh, we attended the induction ceremony two years ago. How, how wonderful. Wow. So, that is great. Where is it? Where do they, where do you, where's the it's plaque? In the high school. At the high school? That is great. Yeah, the plaques are in the high school. I brought, I, I think I have the one for Michigan Senior Olympics with me. Oh, okay, maybe we get, get the two of that. So should we get a picture? I mean, you want me to uh, pull some of these? Yeah. It probably was in 1936 when Michigan had a very bad winter, a lot of snow. And we walked up Belmont Road, walked down West River Road to Belmont to walk up to school. And I can recall just south of Rogue River Road, <clears throat> there were six of us going to school. We were walking on the top of the snow drifts. Our feet walking on that path in the top of that snow drift was higher than the top of the snow plow that went by. Oh my goodness. So it was probably about eight feet deep snow at that time. But you still walked to school. <laughs> and there was choice, right? <laughs> no choice. I always wondered how the teacher got there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been so interesting, and um, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>